Turn on. This meeting is being recorded. Is that? You know what I need is I need I, I need to put a post-it note there to remind me. Oh, by the way, start recording. Uh, okay, so April April SRS meeting. Welcome everybody. All the stuff that I said before. Pretend that I'm saying it now. Okay, here we are. Caught up. Um, <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so uh, thank you, Richard, uh, for uh, helping me out there, and um, and then also uh, if there's a even one other person perhaps that could uh, could help me out with that, that would be great. And uh, you can you can either uh, can reach out to me at the Seattle Robotics um, email link there if you like. So um, okay, let's see. Uh, Okay, so this kind of stuff I chatted a little bit about. Oh, uh, yeah. So probably when when Lloyd's doing the the, the in person meeting stuff, he will probably need a little bit of assistance locally to be kind of help. Maybe some people to help sort of run stuff behind the scenes to help that happen smoothly. So I think the uh, I, th I believe the first facility has things. Will probably have things pretty well set up. I, I think there will probably be a PA system available that we can use. So that'll, that'll kind of help for people hearing. Um, and um, uh, of course they have internet in the building. And uh, if we, if there's, if it's possible to use their computers, even to run the meetings, run the actual zoom meetings, uh, that sort of thing that um, hopefully there will be relatively little physical setup required to, to get things up and running. So we'll see what uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, let's see, uh, stuff that's, uh, coming up here. So you can, you can go to, um, the, uh, SRS website and then there's an announcements block on the, on the left side of the screen that I try to kind of throw stuff into. And then I'll, I'll, as, as events pass here, as you can see the battling robotics Monroe that's happening uh, today and tomorrow. So once that becomes a past event, I'll kind of move that into a separate place. Um, or maybe just uh, just take it off of there. Um, but there's uh, stuff happening uh, all uh, all through uh, all throughout the uh, spring and summer and and fall in the over the next um, you know next few months. So uh, uh, be sure to check that out. Um, there's also the robot events website that has stuff all over the country in case you want to jump in and uh, join in on some of those kinds of things. And then. Um, you got the the Snoko Maker Space up in uh, up in Snohomish. Those guys uh, they meet um, more often than we do, and and there's always stuff happening there. And the Pop Can Challenge is going to happen in early May uh, at their facility. So uh, you can find out more details on the Robothon website about that. And then I probably also on on the Snoko Makers um, Maker Space um, Facebook page. I'm thinking. So um, just check those guys out. Hey, Steve. Yes. Um, can I add a little bit to that? Um, sure. Because I noticed that <clears throat> you have it at uh, happening at the uh, Snowco Makerspace. When actuality, it's going to be at the Seattle Center. Oh yeah, yeah. You know what? That's right. I think I remember. I didn't update this slide. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so that will actually be a, so that's an actual open public event at the Seattle Center, just like our robothons then. Correct, and it's with the uh, championship uh, combat robots. Um, it's not the big combat robots, it's like maybe mm -hmm. I think the 30 pounders or something. Um, oh, cool. I think, um, I think that the, some first people are gonna be there too. Hmm. Um, it's the uh, it's the BattleBots group, uh, Western Allied Robotics. Um, mm -hmm. we'll, we're uh, working with them. Uh, so I should say Snowco Makerspace is working with them to do this. They actually are the primary host of the event. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, let's see. That is, uh, yeah, I'll have to... Uh... Uh, thank, thank you, Doug. That uh, that's actually a really good idea. My first slide up there should have big, big red letters. Turn on recording. <laughs> I love it. Oh, and then FRC World Championship next week. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. 
Um, yeah, so, okay, okay, I gotta fix this slide with some, uh, actually, I guess that slide will be, that'll, that slide by the, by the next meeting, that slide will actually be uh, passed, so, um, but I, but is it, um, is, am I correct that it's uh, the Robothon, does the Robothon website have uh, detailed information about that? I don't remember. I don't know if anybody knows. I, so. I have to check. I'll, I'll take a look real quick. Okay. Thanks, Terry. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's also the Snowco Maker. Uh, let's see. Snowcomakers.org. So I'm guessing that uh, that uh, that website probably has information as well. So, um, okay. So, yeah, if you could check on that, uh, just post it in the chat. That would be great. Um uh, the uh, Robothon uh, ev other events uh, coming up. Um, there's going to be another uh, uh, Robothon virtual exhibition event, our number fourth, our fourth event on June 10th, which is the week before uh, the regular meeting for June. And it'll be a noon to roughly 3 p.m. Um, event. And uh, you can, um, opportunity to, approximately what 20 25 minutes or so to share about a project about you know robotics topic of your choice and uh, I am not certain about how many slots they have filled if there's if they're all full but um, if they are full and you're still interested in doing something like that um, do um, I believe it's on the Robothon website so do let them know um, that we're always happy to schedule additional events. If there's enough people that want to do it, um, more than happy to put another one out there. So, um, and let's see. And then in September 9th, uh, Robo, the Robo Magellan in-person event is going to be happening at Sunnycrest Elementary School in, it's in Kent, but it's in the Federal Way uh, School District. So, um, down south, and uh, so that uh, that's also available. That information is available on the Robothon website. And uh, as always, um, send me suggestions for um, presenters. Um, I reach out to these folks, and and uh, I, I need a I need a pretty steady supply of these. I probably um, I would say uh, probably maybe one in ten that I ask uh, will actually agree to, to, to talk. So um, uh, I need a lot of them to kind of keep the pipeline full. So I, I have a couple more of them that I lined up. I'll show you here on the, I think it's on the next slide, but um, do reach out to people, um, invite them to our meetings to, to get a, you know, check out who we are and what we do and uh, tell them a little bit about uh, what we're looking for. And um, if you do, um, find somebody who's in a, um, kind of, I guess it would be kind of Eastern, Eastern European, potentially in, in the Eastern Europe, Europe portion of the country of the world and, and beyond, um, you might check the, um, check their time zone to see whether or not it's compatible with our current setting. And if it's not, we could still potentially, move to an, like a late afternoon time slot like we did for a, a presenter from Japan here um, a while back. And uh, as long as we have plenty of notice so I can let you guys know well ahead of time that that's going to happen for that particular month. Um, most of the time, uh, the presenters can present to us within a what I would call a reasonable time, reasonable local time. Some of them, though, it might be late in the evening. Uh, it could possibly be somewhat early in the morning. I do not want to make it the middle of the night. You know, we're not, we don't pay these people to talk to us. So I'm not going to expect them to show up at four o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning to talk. So uh, we do want to try to give them a, a uh, you know, a time slot that's reasonably comfortable for them. But um, uh there's, uh, you know, Robert, uh, Robert Kellogg has is, is really been really good at sending me lots of stuff. He sends me suggestions for presenters as well as other interesting videos. So I'll, if we get to them, I have a few of those that I may share this time. Um, 
Oh, and then um, you can also also consider uh, presenting on a on a project if you're working on something that you think would be interesting for people to hear about. Uh, please do that, and uh, you know I'm happy to to schedule you. And then also consider leading a facilitated uh, topical discussion like we've done. Um, the, uh, we did it on uh, on telemedicine and remote patient monitoring here um, two months ago. So um, it's pretty easy to do. You go out, do a little bit of research on the internet, maybe pull in a few videos and other examples of things. And then it's kind of a, just provide launching points for questions to, to, uh, to, to just, uh, particularly to ask questions about the technology and then we all just kind of discuss and share and, and have some good have a good time doing that uh, so here's some uh, here's some topical ideas and uh, anything uh, anything jumps out at you you know um, I did um, I did add in a number five here uh, this AI uh, chatbots have, have been in the news extensively lately and, and and in terms of interesting things that people are doing with them Last month, Lloyd led a discussion where we just talked about Chat GPT and and um, Bing's um, Chat Chatbot, but there's lots of uh, lots of them out there right now, and and I think the the next logical step is what are people doing with these things? And uh, people are you know for for better or for worse, you know. I mean, they, you know, you, you know, like like Jim. Uh, uh, Jim Wright would say something like, you know, ro you know, you, robotics technology should always be a used for good not for evil so um but I, unfortunately I, I, ai chatbots probably can be used either way so Steve? Uh, um, yes uh, i just heard this morning i just heard last week's uh science friday podcast and they had a segment about uh, a recently uh, uh produced uh open letter to the ai community uh, signed by many uh uh you know important people uh, talking about the need to uh, 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 have some sort of, a, well, it wasn't quite a moratorium, but the idea was to have a pause and make sure that uh, we're doing a proper job of, uh, of vetting these things before they're made available to the public. Apparently, mm -hmm. uh, some people have, uh, have committed suicide uh, uh, and been led by the hand to do that by chatbots. Oh, good grief. Well, that's just one of the things. The, the, the basic idea is, uh, they were talking about how um, um, the, the chatbots that have been put produced so far, they go through a sequence where they have many people try to use the chatbot, and uh, from the result, they tell the chatbot good dog or bad dog, uh, to try to, to train them not to do such things as, uh, oh, I don't know, many, many things that you wouldn't want it to do, basically. Uh, you don't want it to uh, um, uh, teach you how to build uh, uh, mat weapons of mass destruction or whatever. There are many things that you would rather a chatbot not be able to do or not, not try to do. And uh, so uh, that, I guess uh, the, the latest uh, GPT, they, they had a, a, an announcement that uh, it was 23% better or something like that than the previous bot at not doing bad things, which gives you some idea of we've got a ways to go. Yeah. But very interesting yeah. discussion on, and that was uh, Science Friday, which is just a, a podcast you can look up. I suspect that no matter how hard anybody tries to put a stop or even slow down AI or robotics, it's a hopeless task. It's too easy to do on your home computer, and there are people gonna, that are going to do it. I was going to say, I'll, I'll go ahead and put this link in the chat here. Okay. Um, this That link won't be live for too much longer because that was me tossing up an AI image generator on my server just to test out some compute GPU hardware for doing some image recognition tasks against my three terabytes of photos. You know, it really is just a download a package and press a button if you want to do AI. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Well, see, see, we've already got the launching point for a great discussion on this topic. So, um, so I'm, you know, I, I, I'd say that one's that one's definitely uh, high on the list for uh, for a, 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 an informal facilitated discussion. So, okay, let's see. Um, so, here's the lineup that I have so far. I don't know why that says CS April, but uh, it does. I think that was supposed to, oh, I know what that was supposed to be control. Um, that was supposed to be a, a, a bold. I usually like to bold the, uh, this, the current month. And uh, looks like I got to, I got to fix that. Anyway, um, let's see, is, uh, is anybody from the UW Advanced Robotics uh, on, on the meeting at the moment? Uh, yes, we are. Wait, uh, let's see. How are, how are you? Uh, are you uh, Derek? Yep, that's me. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Welcome, Derek. Thank you for uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, we are. Uh, okay, cool. Okay. I was, uh, yeah, I was kind of scanning through there and it's like, well, I think maybe. So, okay. Appreciate you uh, clarifying that for me. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's see where we leave off. Okay, so so I got a couple more here. So we actually uh, the next open slot is clear out in November. So we are uh, we're uh, we're doing good for uh, having lots of people coming uh, presenting to us here over the next few months, and um, hopefully uh, it won't take me long to fill this thing all the way through the end of the year. So I might. Uh, I might consider throwing that uh, that chatbot uh, discussion in there. That that would fill up another month. And let's see, post uh, post meeting virtual discussions. Um, so I guess I today I can't really hang around for that. Um, but I'm happy to pass the uh, the host baton to uh, somebody else if uh, you guys want to continue to uh, to talk. Uh, we don't record that part of the meeting, so you can pretty much say whatever you want and. You know, conversations can go in whatever direction you want. But um, anyway, um, so I think that's all of the stuff that I have. Uh, there's any any questions from anybody about uh, anything from any of my previous slides or, or just general any general questions before we kind of open it up? Derek. No, sorry, I left the mic unmuted. Um, oh. Yeah, it's a uh, pretty busy morning here for us. We got a couple of events happening at the same time. Cool. Well, we are, uh, you know, we, we will uh, we will be getting, you know, putting. Well, we'll, we'll we're going to have a, a little bit of our own uh, uh, club members sharing here for the next approximately half an hour or so. Uh, and then uh, and then we will take a short break and then we'll put you guys on. So. Um, we are uh, we're looking forward to what you have to uh, share with us. I, I did a little bit of looking on your website there and it was pretty cool. I was uh, I was very impressed. So. All right. Um, so at this point, who has something that they would like to sh share about? Come on, don't all jump in at once. Anybody? I've been too busy doing other things, I guess, Steve. <laughs> oh, I know the oh, feeling. I, I, Steve, I think I just wanted to add on the event, the robotics event that's happening this weekend, the BattleBots, is uh, uh, at the Northwest Hobby Expo at the Monroe, Monroe County Fairgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, there's multiple things going on at, at that event. Just, just kind of to let people know, if you're into remote control stuff, that's a large part of what's up there at the Hobby Expo each year. And they have a swap meet area too, where you can get um, parts and different things for a lot less than just buying them commercially. Hmm. Um, and uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what the full venue is this year, but they do often have um, RC racing of, of cars and boats and planes and blimps and sometimes uh, drone racing. 
but I'm not, I'm not sure if they have drone racing this year. Um, uh, just to throw that out there. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, let's see here. Let me, uh, it started yesterday and it's, uh, all day today and it goes till five or six tomorrow evening. Okay. Let's see here. So I'm looking at the, uh, Oh, wow. So this is, let's see. So this is river. Oh, this is okay. This is in December. Okay. Sorry. This is a, I have a, that. This is the length that I had out there. looks like this is a little bit different. Uh, this one looks kind of cool though. Vex robotics competition called river bots. Like, Whoa. Huh. And it's happening in the middle of December. Wow. <laughs> oh, it's in Monroe, Michigan. Okay. Okay. So that's a, wow. Michigan in the middle of December. Yikes. <laughs> okay. Anybody, anybody else? All right. Well, let me, uh, let's see, let me get back to my, let's see here. Get back to my, there's my page. Uh, okay. I am going to, eh. Okay, I'm going to share something here in a sec. Okay. Share that one. And I don't know if any, uh, oops, let's see. I guess you can, oh, maybe I should, uh, yeah, I guess I need to, uh, need to share the the tab audio here so you can actually hear it oops it's, oh, that's interesting okay optimize for video clip okay i will give me just a sec here to redo the sharing on this Welcome to my workshop. For the last year I've been working on an open source robotic mower. Today I've got something to show for it. Let's be honest, the current generation of robotic lawn mowers kinda suck. All they do is drive a straight line until they hit the boundary of your lawn, rotate for some time and repeat the whole process until the battery is dead and they need to follow the perimeter wire back into the docking station. I thought to myself, let's improve on this. So the open mower project here was born. The open mower is able to localize itself using very precise RTK GPS and therefore is able to mow the same area very efficiently. This not only means that it is way quicker to finish the same job, but also that the setup which is required is a lot less. You don't have to bury a perimeter wire into your lawn and you can even have multiple areas and the robot can roam freely between them. For example, if you have a lawn in front of your house and one in the back, the robot is able to start with the first area and after finishing, it can drive to the second one and continue from there. But enough talk for now, let's finally see it in action. As I have mentioned before, you have to teach the mower where it should mow. This is done by driving the robot around the area using a remote control. 
here you can see my dad controlling the robot using a standard Xbox gamepad. Areas like trees can be avoided by teaching a no-go zone. This is also done simply by driving around the areas. If you have more than one mowing area, you can just repeat the whole process. At this point the setup is finished and your robot is able to mow. At first it drives around the outline to ensure that it will not cross the perimeter even during turns later on. Then it will mow the rest of the area in a linear pattern. If you like this project, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future updates. As space for this project I'm using an off-the-shelf robotic mower. This is because you get most components in a neat package for around 400 euros. You get the main mowing motor and the two drive motors with encoders on it, as well as a battery and a waterproof sturdy enclosure. This is cheaper than buying the components individually. All electronics inside are replaced by custom ones. And the designs are of course open source in the open mower project. This mower is very hacker friendly because all electronics are connected using standard Molex connectors. But now let's look at the custom hardware. The main processing is done by a Raspberry Pi 4. It runs the larger part of the open mower software, for example navigation and localization. All real-time tasks are handled by the small Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller which is located below the RTK GPS board. The three motors are controlled using three XESC motor controllers. Those are also an open source project of mine. There are also some connectors for emergency stops and a user interface, as well as a sound module. The user interface board fits in the original shell and so the buttons can be used as expected. If you want to build your own open mower, check out the GitHub page and join the Discord if you have any further questions. You can find both links in the description below. Thank you for watching and Alright, so I thought that was a that was pretty cool, a pretty cool approach. I don't know uh, those of you who've if you've ever gone out and looked at robotic lawnmowers and, and you know, considered such a thing, you know, for, for the most part, the ones that I've seen out there are pretty expensive. But uh, this one was uh, the, the, the RTK uh, navigation that they used on this guy was pretty cool because you saw how they, you know, were able to just they didn't they didn't require perimeter wire and, and you know, basically just kind of training it on a few basic features of your yard there, you know, where the edges are and, and where any, any trees or other things that the mower needs to go around are. And then once you've done that, uh, the, 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 the mower remembers those things and then it just does its thing. And, and all you need is a nice chase lounge with a little uh, umbrella, uh, an umbrella shade over the top and a, and a cool drink and you can sit back there and, you know, bring them up on your phone and watch it mow your grass for you. I thought, oh, I, could, I could handle that. I just saw this last week a YouTube video that had a um, a lawnmower that was um, tethered to a tree in the middle of the lawn, and it just it it kept going around the tree, and and as the rope got shorter, it just mowed the whole lawn in a circle. <laughs> and the guy was just sitting in a lawn chair drinking a beer, watching the lawnmower do its thing. <laughs> now I, I I don't know how many of you are, are red green fans. But have you ever seen his 
his um <laughs> <laughs> he decided he decided, you know, be, he's a kind of a lazy guy. Right. And so he decided mm -hmm. that he was going to make a lawnmower that could mow his lawn on on its own. And he he did something like that, except that when Red Green does something, it usually involves duct tape and lots of smoke and sometimes fire and, and things getting broken and, and exploding and, and all this kind of stuff. So. Uh, he uh, he came up with a rather destructive version of that kind of an idea, and and he had his he had his mower, you know, with a, um, I think it was actually it was like a plug-in. It was a plug-in mower, and then it, it it used the cord as the tether. So then, as the thing would go around and around, this 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 like a I think it was a, a, a truck wheel or something like that acted like a spool. To to shorten the wire, then as the robot went round and round and round it, and um, it it was a pretty disastrous project, like most of his projects tend to be. So it was, uh, but it was quite funny. It's a, it's a great show. If you don't, they, all the episodes are on YouTube. So if you you're looking for a little bit of uh, amusement, just you know, crazy stuff, you know, definitely uh, check those out. Duct tape is the handyman's secret weapon. Yep, that's it. That's uh, that's his. Uh, that's his motto. And let's see. And, and if if women don't find you handsome, they should find you handy. I think that was his other one. So any other uh, any other comments on that one? If not, I will move on to another little guy here. All right, I think there's, yeah, there are, okay, there's a video. So let me, uh, I'm going to share this one. And we're going to go stubby window. So this is uh, Stubby Willow X, or maybe Willow 10, I don't know. So ultimate outdoor robot can perform hundreds of tasks. <clears throat> the video on this one kind of left me going, ah, okay, now wait a second. This thing seems a little bit too, a little bit too good to be true. So but I will let you, uh, I will let you be the judge of that. And I think... I wonder if you'd be able to hear this. Oops. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. 
interesting. You guys hear me okay? Could you guys hear the uh, any of the audio on that one? I heard the music. I didn't music, hear it. Music, yeah. Yeah. That was it. That's all there was. So that, I mean, this looks like at least, I mean, according, you know, from, uh, from what I'm seeing here, let's see, let me get back to it. Um, let's see if I'm, if, if I'm to, if we're to believe that such a thing is actually possible so far, we only have a prototype. It says here, uh, Eve plans to launch this robot by the end of 24 delivery schedule for 25. Um, I, I, I don't know about you, but I saw this robot doing some pretty darned amazing things. And, and I, I, I you know, they're thinking, you know, $5,000 for this thing. And it's like, ah, I, I'd have to see this to believe it. This sounds like an Elon Musk type of a, you know, thing where he's uh, loves to go and throw something totally impossible out there and, and talk about it. Like, yeah, we'll have these, uh, you'll be able to buy one of these here in six months or something. And, and it's like, you know, you saw what that little guy was doing, you know, picking weeds and, and uh, pulling up carrots and, and de delivering them to a little bin. And, and uh, I mean, it, clearly that was a that was all computer generated stuff, too. I mean, there was that rope that was not even a, a video of some kind of a prototype actually doing it. I mean, their prototype was a pretty much a virtual prototype. But um I mean, that would be a genuinely useful robot if you could actually make something that could do those kinds of things. So any, uh, any other thoughts or comments on that? Yeah. Well, there is the uh, farm robot, which is uh, on a track that roads, uh, roads, uh, runs across your garden and does the planting and the weeding and fertilizing and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yep. I have a, in fact, I have, I have a video of, a, of a one that I just read about that does, um, it uses a laser to zap weeds and uses AI to, to be able to sort of differentiate between what's a weed and what's not. Um, and I can, uh, I can show you that. But uh, well, so as far as the cost, as goes, as the cost goes, you know, we, we were selling the Dexter HDI for, what was it? seven grand originally and then i think they bumped the price up to 10 but uh, you know the point is you you can make a pretty low cost robot arm the thing that's unrealistic about that is the um is the programming i mean that's pretty pretty amazing um programming i've i've done a little teeny tiny bit of work with um i like growing plants inside in arrow gardens and stuff like that um and uh, I just I like the idea of being able to have like cherry tomatoes in the middle of winter and in the middle of summer when it's too hot. Um, and I've done a little bit of work with an open MV cam and uh, and my Dexter um, taking a little brush and going around and finding the little yellow flowers and then rubbing the brush on the flower and then going to the next flower so that you, you know, pollinate it because there's no bees. <laughs> thank God inside my office um and and that uh that I've, I've had some limited success with that i'm not going to say that it's ready for prime time it's quite difficult to get the the depth sensing done without being overwhelmed with data and, and having to just slow down to a you know complete crawl so anyway that all of the all everything being integrated and having the actual application and all of that programming being done, I I doubt that strongly. But the cost of the robot, eh, it's possible maybe. I just uh, put a, a link in the in the meeting notes for a robot we've seen videos of before called the turtle that does gardening. Uh, as well. I don't think it's near $5,000 though. <laughs> yeah, the, the turtle is the one that goes around and does weeding basically by by rolling over the stuff. Um, I'm, I'm guessing the, the, the issue with that one is the same issue that I have with my Roomba getting stuck on things all the time. But if you, you know, if you prepare your garden well enough for it, it's probably quite useful. 
yeah, it definitely has to have the, the garden be groomed and structured. So there's, you know, not a lot of obstructive items in the way. Steve, if you're talking, you're muted. If you're mumbling, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, you're I right, I was muted. Go ahead, go ahead, uh, James. Oh, I was just gonna say, I added a picture of the setup to that link to the spreadsheet that I posted uh, in the chat. Okay. There yeah, the thank you. Twisted string actuators, just so you could see the sort of the um, the setup and how I was doing the testing. Okay, thank you. So uh, here's the here's the article. Um, uh, this carbon robotics got a, a thirty million dollar cash infusion to to sell more of these things. So this is actually not a a brand new product. It's something that they've been working on. Um, and is that the is... carbon robotics out of San Diego? I believe so. Let me see. Uh, let me go back up here. Do they? Well, you know, it's. Uh, uh, their office is in downtown Seattle, in South Lake Union. Oh, it's in Seattle. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me. Um, um, okay. So all, all this, all they're showing is you can see the, uh, you know, this is a view from underneath the machine there, and you can see the the various weeds uh, being terminated with extreme prejudice. That's all. That's all this video is. It's just kind of a little demonstration here. So um, it's pretty cool. I mean, they're just. <laughs> That uh, when I when I was watching that video, I was reminded of the um, the mosquito zapping um, fence that um, trying to remember what the um, it was. Um, I don't remember the name of the company that was working on it, but it was um, you know they they were looking at something. Yeah. Which say that again. His name started with an M. Ah, worked for the. Um... Vulture, Paul, 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 Paul Allen's. Yeah, yeah, it was, okay, Intellectual Ventures, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I, you know, I haven't heard anything more about that. Does anybody know, did that, uh, is, did that thing move forward? I mean, you know, they were, uh, they were using a very sophisticated vision system to, to, to spot the bugs and then a laser that would just basically it blew it would blow the wings off of the off the little critters you know it was actually they had some really cool um slow motion video of the laser you know what the laser does when it hits the bugs and it was uh, <laughs> pretty interesting pretty interesting to watch let's see here I got some, uh, my son and his girlfriend are visiting here. And so they're, uh, you know, see them in the background there behind me. Wave. <laughs> uh, let's see. They're missing a bet by not using, what is it? Let's see. Missing a bet by not using a cable bot like Skycam instead of the gantry. Ah. Oh, you mean like a, like some, a gantry over the field then? Is that what you're suggesting? No, that that's what they're doing right now. If you click on the link, you'll see a video of their um, of their actual robot, which is oh. literally just like a CNC gantry that runs back and forth over the top of the garden bed. And and okay. it's I mean it's I'm not saying it's not a great setup. It is. It's pretty darn cool. It can 
you know, water and weed, and it can even plant seeds with the little back and head. And the, uh, it's a beautiful little machine. But what I'm saying is you could expand that. The, the problem with gantries is they don't scale well, right? You start getting bigger and bigger, and then the gantry has to be heavier and heavier and heavier, and you need bigger motors to run it. And you've got all kinds of, you know, it becomes unsafe because it's heavy and all of this stuff, right? If you go to cables instead and do something like the Skycam, um, then you can cover your whole backyard with it. I, I believe you could cover your whole backyard with it. There's actually a, a, an absolutely brilliant 3D printer called the Arcus 3D, which is a, a Skycam based, I mean, it's, it's a cable bot, but it's a 3D printer. Um, that the, the thing that's cool about it is that it uses a pole in the center to provide downward tension. So instead of just gravity pulling the load point down, the load point is literally being pushed down because there is a set of cables that go down to the bottom as well as a set of cables that go up to the top. And the pole is balanced between the two sets of cables. So just imagine like Skycam, right? And you've got the camera down at the bottom being held by the cables that, that, that go down from the winches, right? Now imagine another set of cables that go up instead of going down. And between the load at the bottom where the camera is on Skycam and the cables that go up, there's a pole that connects those two points. So now what's happening is that the pole is pushing down instead of just gravity on the camera. And the top of the pole is being pushed down by the, by the set of cables that go up. So the whole thing is in tension. It becomes a Bucky Fuller tensegrity thing, but one that can move around, right? So you don't have any problem with the load point, um, like shaking or not being, you know, steady or whatever. But even if the load point does shake, or if, even if it isn't steady, you can still just go really, really slow because guess what? You're working with plants. It's not like you need to keep up with them. <laughs> so, so, you know, this thing can move to a new location wait a half an hour for the vibrations to damp out and then plant the seed, right? <laughs> or, you know, um, there, there's ways of like, for example, it could have spikes on the bottom that stabilize it when it's in position and then it could, uh, you know, apply torque to kill a weed or something like that. I have a whole presentation. Didn't I do a cable bot presentation here once before? You, you, did, a, you did one on the Skycam. Yeah, yeah, which was which was fascinating, by the way. Yes, we love. Yeah, that. so that that's the idea is basically they could expand the system to cover your whole backyard, and then the really cool part of that is when you have a party, your your bot can serve drinks with a little tray on the bottom <laughs> of the thing instead of you know a weeder, right? And and in between weeding or taking care of your yard, it can pull up and have a webcam on there that checks for rabbits. I don't know about anybody else, but so for now, James. Yes, ma'am, sir. Can <laughs> you can you use the same reel at each corner of the field uh, with just like uh, idlers to make the cables go to the reel, or do you have yeah. a separate reel for the upper and lower cable? No, that's that's the beauty. Um, I'll try to pull up a, a link if I can and post a link to that Arcus project, but it's it's one motor and then the cable goes, uh, there's a set of cables driven by that motor that go up and another one that goes down and then the pole is in between the two. So I was yeah. thinking just idlers would be enough to make it tra a track to the reel. Yeah, yeah. Um, th so basically you have to be a little bit careful because you need to make sure that <clears throat> You need to make sure that um, the the motion of the top one doesn't it, it has to track in the correct direction if that makes any sense. So I'll I'll post a link to the that's my presentation that I gave and if you go to the like third slide on it, there's a link to the Arcus C1 which I will now post in there and that'll give you the picture that shows how it's done. And I have more than enough time talking about um, uh, cable bots uh, because let me tell you Steve if you let me I will just talk the whole meeting long about <laughs> I'm utterly fascinated and 
part of the reason why I'm doing all of this work with twisted string actuators is that it dawned on me that you could you could make. I, I get so excited I'm thinking about this. It's just so freaking cool. The cables, the cables could be twisted string actuators. In other words, instead of pulling the cable in or out, if you twist it and it shortens because you're twisting it, then there's your actuator it's built into. So now you don't have any need for gearing. You don't have any need for any of this garbage. And then, and then, and then, you can do visual servoing. You put an April tag on the load point. You know what an April tag is, right? The little bar, it's like a little barcode. It's a 2D barcode, like a QR code or whatever, right? But it's a, it's a specific format called an April tag. And there's a lot of software available to look at an image that has an April tag in it and then decode from that image the exact position and orientation of the April tag, right? So now you put an April tag on your load point. You have a camera looking at the thing. And you don't have any need for, for position feedback on the actuators anymore. You just say, okay, the tag is too low. Drive all the twisted string actuators a little harder. And the April tag gets pulled up into the air, right? Oh, the April tag's too far to the, to the right. I want to go to the left. Okay, we'll take the cables that are on the left and pull those in a little harder and let the ones on the right release a little bit, right? So now you've got, you've got a robot with Think about the bill of materials. It's three DC motors. You don't need <laughs> steppers. You don't need any. You don't need encoders. You don't need any of that. It's some some twine string cabling, or in this case, it looks like the one that works the best is actually slick and hose. Um, and then you've got a a load point at the bottom, April tag, a camera, and a GPU. Which the weird thing about computing is that GPUs down don't cost anything. Right. I mean, it's it's kind of amazing how little computing costs these days. Um, and then as long as you don't mind being a generation behind. Say it again. <laughs> as long as you don't mind being one generation behind. Exactly. Exactly. I'm I'm never a cutting edge person. I'm always like a little bit behind. That's that's the place to be. Um, and then it, just a super simple control system that has some idea of which cable to pull in more in order to go in order to move the April tag in a particular direction. And that's the whole bill of materials. Having said that, it probably won't work, but um, you know, it's like worth trying. So that's wow. what I'm working on. Wow, that just sounds like way too much fun. Okay, well, you, you might have to talk some more about that sometime, but uh, yeah, like you say, once you get going, man, there's no stopping, right? Okay, um, it is, uh, it's coming up on uh, about 11 o'clock your time. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to call about a five minute break here. And, and uh, then I will, um, we will bring our presenters uh, up from the advanced robotics of, of the University of Washington. So um, let me see here, I will get the uh, window there. All right, so now you can see that we are just, uh, so that's my time there, mountain time. So I'm just crossing 12 noon. So at about 12.05, we will uh, regather and uh, start with our feature presentation. Hey, James, the GPU I tossed on my server to do that um, stable diffusion is a 2016 GPU because they're so cheap now. It's a, a how many, what did you say? I couldn't quite hear you. It's from 2016. It's a Pascal core uh, P100. Uh-huh. And I mean, it, it processes those images fast enough. I mean, it, yeah, it's yeah. a cool demo, yeah. Costs about, nice. what, nice a, a cost about a 10th of a cent for each of those images. Yeah, I was I was talking to somebody the other day about um, I, I guess when the Jetson Nano had come out or when the Jetson right. I don't know what it was it come out. Yeah, yeah. I seem to remember the cost was like I was like four or five hundred dollars. Maybe I am disremembering that, but um, he was talking about buying one. I was like, well, that's an awful lot of money. He was like, no, they're only one hundred and fifty bucks. And I was like, wait a minute, the Jetson Nano is one hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. And and I was just thinking about like 
how much computing capability that has and the GPU and everything in it. Right. And, or, and, and I was thinking about like what chat GPT can do now and you know, what the, all of these image generation systems can do now. And I'm like, dude, I, I started off with an 1802 and 256 bytes of memory. The, right. the advances in the computing industry <laughs> are just stunning. Just stunning. Blows me we had away. A, we had a guy come in sort of for an interview, you know, part of the Amazon layoffs and decided to move out here to the middle of nowhere. And it's like wanting to know what embedded processes we're using for our amplifiers. And the fact that we have, we're still using processors with 4K of flash and 128 bytes of RAM. Like it doesn't run Linux, I don't know what to do anymore. Because oh well, that's an interesting. I'm I'm glad to hear that there's still at least one job out there somewhere where <laughs> being able to work without a full operating system is considered an an uptick. Because what I, right. what I see in the industry is if you don't know how to work, you know, like they say embedded, and I think, oh, okay, it's an eight bit processor with a few k of RAM and a, you know maybe a meg of flash at best, right? But what right. they mean by embedded is like a full right. on Linux computer right. <laughs> running inside of a thermostat. <laughs> right. It's like, I get it that the, you know, at the hardware level, the hardware costs the same. And that's the, that's the hard part. You know, like the price for a, you know, an 8 bit processor anymore is pretty much the same as, you know, a multi core 32 bit processor. It's freaking amazing. That and and we have uh, we have rockets landing on their tails, right? Like like Flash Gordon. I mean, it's 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 pretty wild time to be old. Oh, I'm sorry. My wife overheard me say that. Now I'm in the doghouse. <laughs> Yeah, my, my wife's three years older than me, so that's yeah, uh -oh. that, that was bad. <laughs> no, I uh, when the uh, Jetson Nano came out, I got a couple of them, and they were sixty dollars a piece. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have was the, I must have been thinking of something else that I thought was expensive. Yeah, I we just looked at the website the other day, and they were one hundred and fifty. Oh, <clears throat> you know what? <clears throat> we were looking at development system for 150. Yeah, Maybe right. The actual, the main module was less, I guess. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking about, but that anyway. That that it just it just triggered my thoughts about how far they've dropped. Um, it's pretty pretty freaking amazing. Yeah, yeah. my first uh, microprocessor project was uh, building a uh, an 8080 processor. We had a uh, logic analyzer of which two of the address bits didn't work and we had a cross compiler which produced a paper tape which we would then use to burn uh, EEPROMs. Yep. So yeah that was uh, <clears throat> fun. Yep. <laughs> yeah I have a, a logic analyzer. speaking of logic analyzers I have a logic analyzer buried behind me on the desk that I love to find a museum that would take it it's an hp unit yeah very lovely unit it cost thousands of dollars when it came out and it's utterly useless today <laughs> it's been replaced it's been replaced by a my my lab nation smart scope will do more and do it better and has a much nicer user interface and cost me what was it 200 and change curious curious mark on youtube i've got rid of a bunch of stuff through him could, could you say the name of that uh, analyzer again? Uh, I, I don't even remember now. It's an HP something or other. <laughs> oh, not not the uh, the old one, the, the current one. one. <laughs> oh, the new one. Uh, yeah, Lab Nation Smart Scope. If you get a chance, I really love those. Now, the, the one thing, um, it has really low analog resolution. It's only an 8-bit A to D. Um, That's pretty but neat. it's but it's fast, so it's uh, here. I'll post a link to it in the chat. I love the thing mostly because it has the best 
user interface of anything I have ever seen before. You can like do a two finger uh, spread, you know, to, to zoom in basically on a, on a thing, which is, you know, adjusting the time base on the scope. Um, and two channel analog and 16 logic analyzer channels. No, I'm sorry, eight. Eight input channels on the, um, on the logic analyzer. And then there's a wave generator, uh, which can do analog or digital. And it runs up to 50 million samples per second. So, you know, it's not super, super fast, but for all of the work that I'm gonna do, it's more than fast enough. Um, I have debugged and, and fixed so many problems. And oh, and the other thing, the, the thing that I've used the most in it is it has all these decoders, right? So right. you can hook a signal up to, <clears throat> you know, like a RS-232 line or an I2C uh, or something like that. And then you, you add in a decoder on the screen and it shows you exactly what the data is that's being sent. And so from that, I mean, you can look at, you know, it, is my problem that there's too much electrical noise? Is my problem that I have the baud rate wrong? Is my problem that the level is shifted. Is it, you know, is it not sending the data that I think it's sending? Am I, uh, is there a polarity inversion? You know, all of this kind of stuff is just like, you can see it in a glance and, mm -hmm. and just fix it. It saves so much time and solves so many problems and found problems, you know, like we just had this whole thing where there was this weird instance that I've never seen before in my life where if you plugged the USB to uh, TTL serial adapter directly into the device, then everything was great. But if you plugged it into the device through a hub, and we tried three different hubs, it would work for 660 microseconds, and then it would cut off. So like whatever was being sent, it would get, it would be able to send the first 660 microseconds and then it would just chop. So what was happening is, is contrary to what normally happens, you could get a message out and get things to work if you did it at like 115.2. But as soon as you slowed it down and tried to do it at 57.6, it took too long and the, and the butt end of it was getting chopped off. I'd never seen that before in my life. And it's a bug in the, I'm sure it's a bug in the Linux driver in the old version of the operating system that was running on this little box that we were trying to work with. Um, and, hey, James, yeah. I, I, I hate to jump in here, but we need to get our presenter rolling. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Did I, 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 I didn't notice the time. My bad. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, um, I'm going to, uh, Derek, why don't you go ahead and get your, uh, get, get, go ahead and share your screen. And I will just do a brief introduction for you guys. And um, so we will uh, get you rolling here. So we, so we have um, the, uh, I guess there's, there's several members. Be sure to introduce all, uh, whoever all is with you there from the Advanced Robotics at the University of Washington. Uh, very, very cool group. Um, I was just looking at the, on the front of the website, it says uh, coalition of 70 plus engineering, comp science, physics, art, and business students pursuing their passion for robotics and technology. Hey, that sounds like our kind of people. We love it. Uh, founded in 2015 uh, at the first, uh, as the first North American team to compete, their goal, common goal is to win the RoboMaster competition. So um, we have, uh, I think Derek Wang is kind of leading and uh, I'll uh, turn it over to him. So thank you so much for uh, joining us, Derek. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, so yeah, um, so with me today, I have Benjamin. He is our kind of vision software lead. And then I am our club's vice president this year. Um, yeah, so that's, that's us. We're both students here at the university, uh, undergrad students at the UW. Um, I'm studying mechanical engineering and Benjamin studying math. So, um, Air UW as a team, um, what we do, we are an entirely student run group. We compete in the DJI RoboMaster competition. So, this is an international uh, kind of collegiate robotics competition where universities design and build up to nine different robots each year and then have this like big, 
uh, tournament showdown uh, once per season to discover who really is the Robo Master. Um, <laughs> uh, as for who makes up our uh, group, we're all students and we're what we consider a design build club at the University of Washington. Um, our kind of club work and our efforts are spent designing and building, in our case, robots. Um, and our team is completely run by students. Um, we have faculty mentors, but we really use them as mentors, not as leaders of our group. Um, and then as to why we exist and why we do what we do, um, we're really proud of the educational value we bring in addition to kind of a more traditional college education, um, learning practical hands-on industry applicable skills, um, and kind of empowering and encouraging education of robotics, uh, not just for us in college, but also for those in high school through groups like FIRST or VEX. So for background on the RoboMaster competition, um, a bunch, we make a bunch of different robots, each university, and they go out onto this massive arena the size of a basketball court, and they shoot little plastic balls at each other. Uh, a lot of the gameplay elements are stolen from like popular video games, such as multiplayer online battle arenas and first-person shooters. Um, for example, during the competition, um, the human operators drive the robots through a first-person camera, um, and they sit in an operator room so they can't see the robots, they can't see the field, um, and you know, as part of this video clip is you know, what they're actually seeing during the competition. Um, so these are some video clips from last year's competition. Um, international travel, um, normally our competition, that big competition happens in China. Um, international travel has been tough ever since the pandemic. So. Uh, all the North American universities with teams that do RoboMaster, we banded together and started putting on our own North American conference, which has kind of become the de facto international competition. Um, and I'll touch more on that right at the very end, because um, there's some very exciting updates on that competition for this year. Um, but yeah, um, kind of competition's been described as paintball with robots. And like I said earlier, a lot of video game aspects the kind of rough goal of the game is to destroy the enemy base, uh, which is that kind of triangular looking structure in these video clips. Um, and then I'm gonna go through and introduce all the different robots. And then in this process, talk a little bit about kind of the anatomy of the robots and how they work. So on our robot, uh, this is like the first of the nine different robots, uh, which is called the hero. Um, but I think just on this one, I've added a couple little, uh, what are they called? <laughs> Annotations yes. to, to describe the different parts. So um, generally our robots, uh, they have a chassis. So that carries the drivetrain, kind of holds everything together. Um, pretty standard for you know self-contained robots that move. Um, armor plates. So these are pressure sensors. During the game, this is what we have to shoot at. So we launch the balls to strike the armor plates. They detect that impact, and then it virtually deals damage to the robots. Um, unlike battle bots or combat robotics, we're not trying to physically destroy the enemy robots. Uh, we destroy them virtually in the game. Um, that way, the robots, uh, it's a lot less expensive when we're not trashing our robots every time we uh, use them. So. Um, on top of the chassis, we have mounted the turret. So this is usually a two-axis gimbal, so pitch and yaw. This lets us aim the launcher at whatever it is we want to shoot at. Um, there's a variety of different launcher designs, and there's two different projectiles that are used during our competition. So the hero is a very unique robot in that it launches these large projectiles, which are very similar to golf balls. Uh, they're the same size and shape. Um, and these large projectiles deal a lot of damage um, to the armor plates, uh, you know, virtually. Um, I'll get to the other kind of projectile as well. And then lastly of importance, the video transmission module. This is the first person camera that the human operators see through. 
Um, so second on the list, the engineer robot. This is a pretty unique robot in that it doesn't have a turret or a projectile launcher. It kind of serves a utility role. So this is footage from the 2019 competition, uh, the last time that our team traveled to China for the international competition. Um, and in this year's set of the rules, the engineer collected ammunition for that hero robot from these foam cubes uh, that were placed in the middle of the field. So the only way for your hero to have ammunition was if you had an engineer go fetch it from the field for you. Um, and yeah, it, it kind of has like task and objective oriented purposes. Also things like uh, when your robots get knocked out by losing all their HP, it's the engineer's job to kind of latch on to your dead teammates and then drag them back to your base and then they can respawn and then get back into the game. So the numbers three through five, these are all built around the same archetype of robot. Um, so it's what's called the standard robot. It is the kind of most generic kind of backbone of the team. It fires these small projectiles. They're 17 millimeters in diameter. They're bright green and they look like grapes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't think they taste like grapes. Um, these robots, they instead of firing golf balls, they fire these the small projectiles quickly. So more of like a rapid fire. Um, and in the game, their purpose is more for engaging enemy robots and fighting enemy robots, while the hero robot's job is more for destroying the base and kind of taking out objectives. Um, number six, we have the aerial robot or the drone. Um, this is kind of moving away from what we consider ground robots. So up until now, the hero, engineer, and standard robots are all ground robots. They have a chassis and a drivetrain. They move around on the ground. The, the last couple are a little more unique. So the drone flies, and then we attach a turret to it. So during the game, we have uh, a couple opportunities to kind of call in air support. And then we can launch the drone. It flies over the middle of the field, and then it can shoot uh, down on the enemies for you know, some limited amount of time with a limited amount of ammunition. Um, uh, in addition to that, they kind of say we can use it as like a reconnaissance tool. They're, the turret is operated, once again, uh, first person. So, you know, in a kind of first person game, there's a lot of fog of war uh, information battle happening about figuring out where the enemies are on the field. And there's some gameplay strategy for how we deal with that. And one of the ways to get information is by uh, using our eye in the sky. Uh, number seven, so we have the sentry robot. This is the robot which is fully autonomous. So there's no human operator for this. Um, in previous years, it's been that the sentry moves back and forth on this steel rail, which is elevated above the ground. Um, that kind of constrained its autonomy to a limited range. But the real focus of the autonomy for the sentry is being able to identify the enemies uh, track the targets and then shoot at them without any input from a human operator. This year, our rules changed. They pulled a fast one on us <laughs> and they got rid of the rail. So we still have to make a fully autonomous robot, but it now has to drive around on the floor. It has to um, localize and navigate on a changing field because there's other robots driving around on the floor um, it's not supposed to crash into walls or other robots, and it's still supposed to do all the jobs it was before, which is identifying and tracking the enemies and uh, fighting them. Uh, we have a dart system. So this is also a pretty unique robot. Um, it doesn't see combat on the field. What it does is it sits way back in our base, and I should have included a map, but... Um, <laughs> Dart system composes of two different robots, the dart launcher and four darts. And we design and build both of these uh, to work together. It sits on our side of the field next to our base, and it can launch these darts to strike the enemy base um, or the enemy outpost, which are you know, fixed structures on the field. And if we're successful in that, it deals a lot of damage to those objectives. 
Um, the challenge is we're striking a target that's, I think, about 120 millimeters square from a distance of 16 meters. Um, and, you know, to try to help this, we've come up with some interesting ideas, which I'll touch on later. And then lastly, which is like, is a little bit of a unique robot, is our radar station. Um, so this is a robot that our team hasn't yet built because um, we're not quite sure what to use it for. But we're allowed to have kind of a fixed, um, like, sensing and compute platform. So this goes outside the field. A lot of people attach cameras, LIDARs, um, and a more powerful computer. And um, like with the drone, it kind of adds to that information game where we can detect enemy robots or our own robots. We can have an outside observer feedback data to our robots um, to kind of improve their performance if we need to. All right. Um, any questions about RoboMaster, um, our competition? So uh, given the, uh, uh, the, the oncoming AI revolution and so on and so forth, is, is, is anybody thinking about the, the wisdom of like teaching robots to shoot at each other? Or is that not something that you guys uh, discuss? I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of joking in my question. Yeah. In case it wasn't clear. I mean, I, I will admit that, especially as someone who's been very heavily involved in the vision side of things, so auto aim and stuff like that, this it is it struck me quite a few times just how military like some of these, like the applications of this are in terms of industry. And so it is a little bit worrying, but for the most part, I think we both, like all of us on this team, just kind of go like, eh, fun with robots or something like that. So. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose if you don't do it, somebody else will, huh? <laughs> I suppose there is that logic to it, too. Yeah. Real genius vibes. <laughs> is there uh, any ability for a team to operate from another country, or do you have to actually be in the arena while you're you're using your your uh, video camera or whatever to uh, to uh, drive the robot? I mean, yes, yeah. uh, for our competition, yeah, we, you do have to be at the competition site. Um, a lot of the kind of background uh, or the underlying logistics for how the robots are able to compete um, is like, is actually pretty, I guess like consumer equipment, like um, the robots connect to each other and to the game server using just like normal, consumer grade Wi-Fi routers. Um, and the first person cameras are just, uh, I think they're also, they operate on the two, same 2.4 gigahertz wireless band. Uh, and so I think unfortunately, if we wanted to operate say over the internet, one, there'd be some kind of technical and logistical hurdles with making sure that's okay with the competition rules. There is a fairly extensive set of rules that we have to follow to compete. Yeah. Um, and two, you start adding things like round trip latency, so uh, latency to send your controller inputs, latency to get your video feedback. Um, and I think where the competition is headed and what I think is really cool is we're heading towards more and more autonomy and automating a lot of the processes that the robots do, yeah. um, such as this autonomous navigation, um, potentially even uh, you know autonomous game strategy where different robots can share information and end up executing fairly complex um, like tactical movements such as you know advancing through certain parts of the field or you know pushing together and the robots could communicate between each other and do that all on their own um, without a lot of human input yeah. right I guess what I'm, I'm thinking is that as that becomes more and more possible that uh, allows more latency between the human operators and the robots mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, you know, we always think that the potential end game is for the software to be so good that you don't even need human operators <laughs> at all. Um, you just grab a couple people to to put the robots in the field and turn them on, and then someone presses the go button, and then the robots figure it all out on their own. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm thinking of like the Mars rovers. 
right? Mm -hmm. they, the, there's so much latency to Mars that uh, they pretty much have to do all the thinking for themselves, but there are definitely situations where they just stop and wait for the, uh, uh, you know, and tell, uh, you know, send, send messages back to Earth to say, um, you know, I can't go any farther because of such and so. And then the uh, human operators uh, uh, work through the whole problem and and uh, decide what they need to do next. Yeah. So you can yeah, imagine I, something like that. <laughs> I, I really like that idea because it, it does push towards more like brains on board on the robots. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's definitely like, I can imagine several years down the line, we start like developing whole like subroutines and stuff like that that can run automatically on robots, something akin to that so yeah yep and i guess to be realistic in our competition um we have like fixed length uh rounds of the game i think a round of the game is five to seven minutes um which means you know if something really does happen uh there's not much you could do about it anyways <laughs> like if, if there's some kind of a software failure or mechanical failure um and uh, at the end of the day, it is just a game for us while right. we're really here to kind of learn the skills, play with cool technology, um, and, you know, just have fun with robots while, while learning about them. I, I guess what I'm thinking is for the, uh, the dynamics of the, of the competition, you could have more competitions if you didn't have to travel as much. Perfect. So you could have an... Uh, an on-site team that you would send that would manipulate the robots to set everything up. And then uh, a, a good part of your team could be at home uh, with arbitrarily complex uh, uh, processing and, and display capabilities, but uh, controlling the robots over the internet. Yeah, definitely not something that we can do right now, but there has been talk of having, yeah, like with the autonomous motion and stuff like that. So yeah, the autonomous localization and navigation. Um, we have a sort of debug server set up on the vision side that sort of allows us to view, like view what's going on through the um, vision processor. It's like, there has been talks and toying around with the idea of having like, you know, Twitch plays, Robo Master or something like that, where someone can, yeah, actually just operate the robot through the internet. So, not something now, but maybe in the future. Right. All right. I think just to keep us moving on time, yeah, we'll definitely be plenty more op uh, opportunities for questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, getting a little bit into kind of our team and who we are. Uh, Entirely UW students. Uh, not to say that we have some kind of rule that says we can't uh, have team members that aren't UW students, but it, they just happen to turn out that way. Uh, <laughs> we have it because, be uh, yeah, because we're just a club that's on the UW campus. Um, and for all of our team members, robotics is an extracurricular activity. Um, everyone has their own uh, academics to take care of and for the most part, we don't get any kind of class credit for participating in this club. Um, everyone is here, you know, taking out their personal time to you know, develop their skills and, and have fun together. Um, so on our team, we split up our uh, kind of organization into four broad categories. Um, so we have mechanical, software, electrical hardware, and business administration. Um, and then within the mechanical team, we further split that up into squads or project groups, which are each uh, lead the development of one of those unique robots. Um, and these squads, we're both trying to have opportunities for um, you know, students to pick up leadership positions and you know, learn how to work on a team, lead a team, um, do things like project management, as well as just being a technical mentor. So a lot of our Incoming team members are freshmen, uh, so they don't have a lot of experience. They haven't taken a lot of engineering coursework. And so they're learning things like CAD skills, uh, mechanical design principles, uh, you know, potentially years before they formally learn those concepts in a class. Um, and it's entirely being taught to them by uh, kind of our older and more experienced team members. Um, and lastly, this kind of 
breaking down the large team into a bunch of small groups encourages teamwork and fellowship. Um, a lot of people have made friends here, including myself. Um, you know, outside of this kind of being a workplace, it's also a social environment, which I think is pretty important for college students. All right, so for kind of what the mechanical team does, um, we believe in like a process where team members do, uh, you know, problem analysis and mechanical design in CAD software. And then, uh, you know, they'll do prototyping and iterations on their design. They'll go through their own manufacturing processes. So we have a student machine shop and uh, we make almost all of our parts in-house. So this is metal parts, 3D printed plastic parts. Um, we've started making our own carbon fiber composites. Um, and almost all of that is made by us. Every, almost everything we design is made by us. Um, and it happens to be made by the same people who design it. So having these students go through the entire front to back design process really teaches them a lot about, um, you know, what are some difficulties you have in a manufacturing process, which you might take, take back to that design process. Um, or how could you, you know, on the flip side, how can you design parts to be easier, quicker, cheaper to manufacture to make your own life easier in the future? Um, and that really encourages a lot of you know, iteration and learning. All right. So um, I guess this is glossed over a little bit, but yeah, we have our divisions of software and we mostly have two major software sub teams. The first one being Vision. Um, and so Vision takes care of, yeah, it's in his name, it takes care of auto aim. So computer-based vision allows us to automatically lock on and shoot at targets. And it also takes care of, um, you know, it like figures out what the velocities of these targets are so that can actually anticipate and aim at them. And for this year, we've also started working on using vision to do autonomous localization and navigation. Um, so that's kind of like what this half of the software takes care of. Um, other half of the software is controls and embedded computing. So this is uh, interfacing with a microprocessor, um, doing communications with all the various devices on the robot using CAN or UART. Um, we do a lot of odometry, so sensor fusion and state estimation of ourselves, um, transforming that into outputs so we can do things like stabilize the turret in the world frame and then combine spinning the chassis with translation in the world frame. Um, and we do this by maintaining and developing an open source controls library, Taproot, which we then use ourselves in our open source controls um, uh, code base. Uh, and then our last team, electrical hardware. So to kind of assist the other teams um, in things like there's a lot of electronics devices on the robot. Um, we do cable routing, and we also do kind of more advanced hardware projects, um, one of them being a yes. supercapacitor bank. Uh, and all these technical projects, there's a section on them later. Um, we'll get much more in depth about kind of the technical undertakings and exactly the purpose of these projects um, that I'm just glossing over at this point. Um, but they'll design, fabricate, and test PCBs, and then ultimately integrate them into the robot as a full system. And then business admin, um, that's uh, my job for this year, which is different from every other year, but team operations, funding and outreach. So we work on funding robot development, um, coordinating with sponsors to get either materials or money. Um, we organize events so we can engage with our community and uh, overall kind of manage the team both technically, so project management, making sure we're doing things on time, um, you know, organizing meetings. Uh, our smallest team by far, but uh, arguably the most important because once the money runs out and everything stops. Yeah. All right. So getting a little more in depth on some of the technical projects. 
that we're doing right now and have done recently. Um, last season. Yeah, so la our actually our auto aim system for all of this year has was just developed last year. So over the course of last year, we worked on an entirely new auto aim system because the previous ones just weren't nearly as good. They were buggy and just pretty jank overall. So um, we had a complete rewrite, uh, entirely new sort of yeah system. And so the way it works, like the sort of components that it requires is that it first needs to identify the plates and their locations on an image. And so we run a machine learning model that is a single shot detector that basically looks for red and blue plates um, and sort of like draws a box, a bounding box around them. And then we combine that sort of information with a stereo camera. So um, we have the VTM So and um, the players use the VTM to, in order to see, but we have a separate camera, which is a stereo camera that sort of uses stereoscopic differencing, which um, if, or if you don't know is about, it identifies depth using the same principle that our eyes identify depth by looking at like the difference between um, two different sensors. And so that from there, we can identify the depth of the plate and that gives us a 3D position. And so if we combine that with the dometry, we can figure out sort of the position of a plate in the world frame. So in the absolute position from which we can um, use a common filter to determine the velocities and accelerations of those plates. And then after we can also then compute the ballistics to figure out what the turrets um, yaw and pitch is supposed to be in order to actually intercept the plate and we need the velocities here because the plates move sufficiently fast that if you just aimed at what the actual position of the plate is it takes too long for the bullet to actually or the projectile to actually reach the plate so the plate would by that point in time probably have moved out of the way um so all that kind of stuff is what vision takes care of and there's also a little bit of a cherry on top which is um we have this estimation of what we call bayblading and so if you look at the sort of video or if we have over there you can see that this robot sort of spinning and the spinning does actually mess with the vision quite a bit because the plates are essentially constantly accelerating and constantly coming in and out of view and so traditional sort of velocity estimation doesn't really cut it um what ends up happening is the robot would constantly just shoot off to the left or the right of the Bayblading robot, it wouldn't actually hit it. And so we have a little bit of extra um, sophistication, a little bit of extra logic that detects whether it thinks a robot is Bayblading using several heuristics and then can figure out its angular velocity. Um, so it just like looks for the frequency at which plates appear and then sends um, timing information over to controls to figure out when it, you want to shoot. So as you can see in the video, it seems to be shooting every so often just to hit the plate. Um, instead of just hosing it down with a constant stream of fire. Oh, we got a question. Oh, okay. I don't know what that is. So, that's um, are you allowed to use structured light systems? Or is it too lots for... Yeah. So, um, if by structured light system, you mean like something like lidar, or do you mean like you know, the the ones that are projecting out a series of little IR points, like oh, the real yes. sense camera. So, so you're using you're using the stereo camera to avoid yes. having to project that. So strictly speaking, it is not quite competition legal to have the um, like a lot of lights sort of projecting outwards. But um, the real sense does actually have and yeah, an array of IR. Um, we just kind of sneak it like we kind of just you know, push under the rug and don't really talk about it. And we can mostly get away with it. Other teams do it too. Um, so it doesn't really seem to interfere with it. Either. And your opponents then shine a laser at you to <laughs> blind your camera? The laser would almost definitely be actually illegal. Like that would get caught. The IR seems to not really mess anyone up. And so we can sort of get away with just leaving it there. Well, they could I'm just also, uh, put a hot source on there and have it rotating in the opposite direction or something like that. So I'm also a little curious about the single shot detector. Um, mm -hmm. do, is there a keyword or something that I could search for for more information on that? Or is that oh, something yes. custom that you're doing? Yeah, so um, you're looking into it. So we toyed around with various sort of, I can like give you some pointers to like some various ML models that we have worked with in the past and we found quite promising. Um, our current um, detector is a slight variation of what is called CenterNet, 
um, which is the name of a model that was developed by a relatively recent paper. Um, so if you just Google Centernet, you'll probably be able to find the original paper that does it. Um, but yeah, it's single shot detection. So um, it's able to identify the corners and the class of, so whether it's red or blue, all at one, all at once. Um, so yeah. Oh, um, got the right link there in the chat. Yeah, that should be right. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, key point triplets. Yeah. Um, so we basically use a modification of it that also includes like a single um, recurrent neural network or recurrent block. So um, hopefully I'm not talking too technical language here, but um, yeah, it's the center net only works on just single images, but because we're taking out a video feed, um, we have some modifications that sort of take into account past images, um, sort of for change memory to make Sorry. it a little more. Yeah, and, and just like searching for certain colors in the frame wouldn't work. There's It's, it's not um, robust uh, enough. So this is actually an interesting question. Um, it actually happens that a lot of teams do use classical CV. So yes, they use colors or they look for like bright spots so they can do some sort of thresholding or sort of, some sort of like classical heuristics. And generally speaking, that is can be a lot faster if you're using the correct processor, which is not what we're using because we're using NVIDIA HX Xavier. Um, so yeah, Jetson. So it's, you know, GPU heavy. But um, we've found that it's like, it's an open question and we're looking into messing around with um, classical CV either this year or next year just to see whether it does perform better. But there are certain limitations because um, the field is surrounded by a lot of like bright lights and stuff like that of both blue and red color. Um, and we would need to basically entirely change our setup because we would have to use cameras with a lot higher FPS, a lot higher uh, resolution. And so currently we just opt for that uh, machine learning route. All right. So we'll move on from this. Um, and there's more on this later for what we're up to this year. Yes. Um, mostly with regards to the navigation. Um, some of the more mechanical projects, uh, we had a hero redesign. So at the beginning of last year, on the left is the CAD model. On the right is the physical robot that we went to compete with. Um, this was a pretty successful robot. Um, but for us, we kind of decided the primary downside was the fact that we had to store the ammunition, the projectiles in the turret. So they rotated with the turret. Um, it's a lot of mass that we have to store high up in the robot. Um, and it adds a lot to the moment of inertia, which overall makes the turret a lot less responsive. Um, and so uh, I guess we'll get to, we'll get to what we're up to this, this year. Um, the Sentry is permitted to have two projectile launchers, two of those small projectile launchers um, on it. What almost every team does is just stick the two of them next to each other, like right next to each other, parallel. Um, and then you kind of just get twice as many projectiles in your stream. But we decided to make two completely independent turrets. Um, so this is the old set of rules of the rail-mounted Sentry. And you can see the two turrets they have the capability to aim at different targets, um, although in practice, they almost always aimed at the same target. Um, yeah. And at the end of last year's competition season, we came back champions in both uh, 3v3 and 1v1 divisions. Um, so with the nine robots that we make, that's for a competition called the RoboMaster University Championship. They only have that competition uh, in China. Um, Unfortunately, there is both not enough funding, not enough competitors to host and have that competition here in North America. So we have a 3v3 and a 1v1. It's kind of like a scaled down version, which they call the RoboMaster University League. Um, it's you know, a lot easier to get into for new teams, and we're trying to grow our RoboMaster community uh, in North America. So much more approachable and easy to get into than having to suddenly make nine robots. <laughs> All right, and then moving on to kind of what we're up to this year, um, we're doing a lot with carbon fiber. So we've kind of pushed our 
carbon fiber manufacturing capabilities. We've acquired tooling and materials, and most importantly, the skills and experience for how it is we make composites um, and things like sandwich panels. Um, and you know, some of the biggest uses is on our new drone. So for safety reasons, we have to build fully enclosed propeller guards. Um, this stops loose projectiles from finding their way to the propellers and uh, crashing the drone, which would be expensive and painful. So um, we need to make these prop cages that are very strong to resist impacts while also being light enough and thin enough to not really disturb the airflow um, and add a lot of mass and inertia to the vehicle. Um, on the other side, for our ground robots, um, in the game, we're limited on the amount of power that the chassis, the drivetrain, is able to use in watts. So for any given amount of power, um, you get more speed and acceleration by having a lighter robot. So you know, we're exploring using carbon fiber strategically um, in a way where we exploit its, its rigidity and its strength. Um, and minimizing weight versus things like using aluminum tubing. Uh, yeah, mostly aluminum tubing. So touching on like the downsides of last year's hero, we've decided to do it again. Uh, this robot looks drastically different because it stores the projectiles in the chassis. Um, and actually the really interesting design philosophy for this robot was the entire chassis is the ammunition container uh, and it is entirely structural. Uh, unlike the more traditional way of attaching the ammunition container uh, kind of onto the turret as an extra piece where its only purpose is to hold the balls. Um, this one, it's like a key integral part of the chassis design is the box that holds the golf balls. Uh, and yeah, we're playing around with using carbon sandwich panels to add a lot of rigidity and strength to the turret uh, because if the turret flops around then uh, the vision system gets very confused about where we're actually going yeah. and which way we're facing um, you know and like rigidity of the robot between your different links um, being able to do those transforms in software have to line up with the actual yeah. real mechanical system uh, and you or you start to get error everywhere mm -hmm. um I mentioned earlier, they changed the rules on the Sentry. So the Sentry is a ground robot. It's got wheels. Um, but we decided to stick with the double turrets because um, it was pretty cool. Um, and there's some distinct advantages, especially with it being forced to navigate autonomously. Um, having two turrets lets us have more cameras seeing the world. Um, you know, so we can get a better estimation of where we are and what's around us. Yeah. And so related to the century, so we, this is what I touched on earlier about the autonomous navigation and engagement and localization, stuff like that. And so that's been the big project for this um, year for vision. Um, and so roughly what it breaks down to and what we've approached, how we've approached the problem is that there are various um, sort of vision markers that you can see here. For example, there's that little like red A that's on the wall over there um, that is they're scattered around the field. We have like letters A through E, both red and blue colors, and we know where they are supposed to be. And so if we are able to do pose estimation on those markers, we can figure out where they are relative to us and thus where we are relative to them. And then we can figure out where our location in the field is. And so that sort of is the main key part of our localization because um, we choose not to rely on just pure odometry like wheel encoders and IMU values because those are very liable to drift as we have seen in the past. So we sort of use this thing as sort of like absolute localization information. And combined with that, we also have experimented with some sort of form of visual odometry. Um, we messed around with Z cameras, um, the Stereo Labs Z, and it turned out that it was not exactly particularly helpful for various reasons. It just wasn't quite built for our purpose. Things like very small things like robots driving right in front of us could mess up the visual odometry. So we opted not to try to integrate that this year, but it's something that may come up in future years, um, especially because 
these markers are primarily an RM um, UL thing. They're just for the 3v3 competition, not for the whole 9v9 one. And so for the real McCoy, we have to like maybe opt for something a little more complicated that uses visual odometry and Z or something else. And so that's another thing that we've been looking into. Besides that, um, as for mapping, um, we also need to generate the map so that we can figure out how to navigate through that map. And that one has been pretty simple because we have um, the cat for what the field is supposed to look like. And so we can simply just generate a list of sort of we occupied squares. Um, that's the way that we approach our map is we represent the map as a grid of about like something like a very low resolution grid something on the order of like half a meter per square um and that's just sort of a and we have a list of occupied squares that are considered like walls that we can't go through and using that we run an a star or a d star light motion planning algorithm um and we've been trying to optimize it for a while now but that's sort of the way that we do our autonomous navigation All right. Um, another cool piece of autonomy. So our dart launcher, we're trying to hit a very small target that's very far away. To just launch the dart with that much precision um, is very difficult. So what we're playing around with is a self-guided dart. So um, you know, we put a battery and a processor and a CMOS sensor onto the dart. Um, we attach some servos attached to uh, these fins for aerodynamic control surfaces. And then our challenge is developing something which, is, you know, uh, somehow do computer vision um, to find the target uh, on a very, very small, you know, microcomputer and then do aerodynamic controls and kind of motion planning for how exactly we're going to steer the dart to, uh, to guide it into that target. Yeah. Um, What's convenient, they do help us out in the rules. Um, the targets that the darts hit, they stick a giant green LED right underneath them. Um, so they do they do give us something to work with instead of asking to do um, to identify the those armor plates using their normal light bars, because I think there's too many other armor plates on the field at the same time. Yeah. So kind of the, the generalized strategy is we're looking for a big green dot. Yeah. And we're aiming right above it. <laughs> um, but this is is happens to be a pretty big undertaking mostly in uh, how we're approaching the the sensor and the computer for this yeah um i think so far the best they got is they stole the sensor out of a wii remote um, and they're they're putting together a pcb for how we get the data out of that so it's some pretty fun hacking going on yeah all right and then our biggest hardware project is the super capacitor bank so I mentioned earlier, our robots are limited in how much drivetrain power they can use. But during parts of the game, we might not be moving, in which case that extra allotted power is kind of wasted. So what we're doing is taking that extra power and storing it into supercapacitors. Um, so they, we have to design uh, both a buck converter and a boost converter to get power in and out of the supercapacitor array. Um, it has to be able to be controlled with software so that while we're charging, uh, we're not exceeding the power limit that's allocated to us. And um, that means later, say when we're moving or when we're engaging with an enemy, we can tell the software to then discharge the capacitors faster than we charge them. So we can uh, kind of temporarily exceed that power limit that's imposed on us by the game rules. Uh, super caps versus batteries. So yeah. Um, there's a lot of restrictions on, so all the power to the robot is sent through uh, this, peak of, this piece of specification equipment. It's part of the rules called the power management module. Um, there, you know, in the gameplay, that's how it's kind of able to kill the robot by just turning off the power to, um, to all the actuators. And since we're rapidly charging and discharging you know, very high amounts of power, uh, we end up using supercapacitors while I think batteries would just not be able to give us that responsiveness. All right. 
Um, nice. And then this is what I think is the coolest project we're taking care of, uh, probably because uh, I'm on this team. You're so, biased. yeah. Uh, oh, this video's not playing. So, this is a balancing robot. So, the standard robot actually has an alternate form. Um, in the rules, if you make a balancing robot, and there's a couple you know, criteria for how they define that, um, then instead of having four small armor plates, uh, you only have to use two large armor plates. And so one of the really cool pieces, uh, advantages this gives you is you could just orient your turret um, along the side where there's not an armor plate, you know, and then you can always just face away from the enemy and you'll never get shot, uh, which is um, a, a pretty interesting strategy that um, I think a lot of people are starting to pick up on. Um, and then as for designing balancing robots, there's a you know wide variety, so kind of like traditional inverse pendulum with two wheels. Um, but I think in, in dynamical systems, we'd consider that under controlled since we only have two actuators to control four available degrees of freedom. Um, we wouldn't be able to either balance and keep ourselves upright while also um, not translating across the floor while maintaining a certain translational position. Um, so teams find ways to add additional actuators to kind of help the robot balance. Um, so we've seen things like reaction wheels um, or mounting a counterweight on a linear rail so they can kind of dynamically move where the center of gravity of the robot is. Um, but the most innovative one that we saw that we were really inspired to kind of um, try to mimic was using active suspension. So using five bar linkages to control where the wheel is relative to the chassis um, gives us a lot of ability for not just being able to maintain that position and angle control, but also being able to vary our height um, and travel over uneven terrain, which exists in the large battlefield. Um, so yeah, this video is from another team. So it's kind of like the original team who pioneered this design. And now we've seen, I think three or four other teams uh, try to mimic what they've they're done to varying levels of success. Um, and now I've experienced firsthand why it's very difficult. To, <laughs> the dynamics behind this physical system are very complicated. Um, but we have you know, the CAD model of the robot that we've developed um, for our purposes. Um, and then kind of we have a wooden prototype. And I think this was taken on Tuesday of how far we've gotten, which is, uh it's a work in progress so you know, that's all i have to say um i think this this is one of the coolest projects we've taken on um and also definitely one of the most technical uh especially for controls and dynamical systems yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> no all right um uh, and then to to kind of wrap up uh, what motivates most of us on this team to kind of be a part of this team to spend, you know, 20, 30 hours a week doing robotics in addition to the tens of hours we spend being students. Um, I think a student's full time job is to learn, um, but this definitely extends outside of the classroom. And so because we do, we kind of structure our team organization and our projects so much like real engineering firms. Um, I think we provide a practical and hands-on industry standard working environment. We will work with industry standard tools um, like SolidWorks. We use, um, it's, I, it's been claimed because I've never had a, a software internship that our like code-based maintenance and our standards for code quality are higher than people have experienced that internship. Most definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and kind of as a result, many of our alum have gone to do great things at great places. So. Um, we've had alumni go to a bunch of local companies like SpaceX, Amazon, Microsoft, Boeing, um, and you know other companies that are not around here like NVIDIA and HPE. We've also had a, a smaller proportion of our alumni go on to get higher education, so master's degrees or PhDs. Um, and it's like it's really inspiring to be a part of like this kind of pipeline to. I guess really, uh, you know, doing cool things as part of your career. Um, and the other reason we do this because it's fun. So 
a lot of our members, especially on our mechanical side, previous, previously did first or vex. Um, like a lot of our kind of local people or people who are here from Washington are, you know, very familiar with first wa. Um, and as a result, we've ended up developing developing a pretty decent relationship with first wa as well. Um, and so we partner with them and uh, uh, I'm not quite familiar with exactly who it is, but uh, whoever runs the VEX competitions around here. And so we've been to a couple of their events during the last couple of months um, to kind of table and talk about our club, talk about robotics past high school, um, talk about college in general um, as a way to like really just um, get out there and give back and kind of spread the love for robotics. Um, and now the very last thing is we have our North American competition every year. And this year is really special because we are hosting the competition at the University of Washington. Um, so it's the de facto annual conference for international RoboMaster teams. Um, there's going to be, I think at this point now, it's uh, 25 plus teams um, from within the US and also Canada, Mexico. So um, there's a team from Italy, there's a team from Japan, and there's a team from Singapore. Um, people are kind of flocking to our conference because of kind of the successes that we, uh, our community has had in previous years putting on this event um, and kind of hosting a really fun and cool competition um, and really pushing it outside of China where the competition started. Because uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult to, to get into it when they're speaking a different language, and, <laughs> um, you know, nothing's on YouTube and yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to engage. So yeah, um, it's at the Husky Union building on the UW campus, the UW Seattle campus. Um, we have a website with plenty of information. Um, the event actually spans five days, but really you're only interested in the last three days. The first two days are more for our operational teams and our kind of competing teams, our visiting teams. Um, and so what I'd really like to ask for is to help us make this event a success, um, whether that's just, you know, showing up as a spectator, um, free admission, open admission, you can just come in and watch. Yeah. And I'd be, you know, it'd be very thrilling Thanks. if we can pack the room full of people um, and just like let us give back to, you know, the community that helps support us. And then if you'd like to, I would personally be thrilled if you volunteer for um, on our website is a description of a variety of jobs that we need volunteers to do. So, um, you know, as a team, this competition is fully put on. You know, nonprofit. It's just so that all these various RoboMaster teams can have a competition to work towards every year. Um, we had to get funding for this event from corporate partners, and so all of the kind of human resources going to be purely volunteers. Um, and there's a link on the website. Um, hopefully, you can navigate the website because uh, we designed that ourselves because we didn't have <laughs> enough money to pay for someone else to host it. Um, there's a link on the website to sign up if you're interested to get more information about volunteering. And yeah, with that, that's... Did, did you mention the dates of this? Yeah. Um, so it's July 7th through 9th is kind of the public dates for... Those are the, the three days of actual competition between the teams. Um, it's also on the front page of the website. So there's the URL to the website, Um I can definitely send a email to steve with more information um, and you know yeah that, that would be great go ahead and uh i've got the website down in uh it actually will show up in the uh, coming events here list that i shared during the meeting but um so yeah that sounds like great fun yeah thank and you know thanks for helping us spread the word because yeah, it's our first time doing anything like this, and we're trying to make this the. It's only the third ever Robomaster North America competition, but we're trying to make it the best ever. So, <laughs> um, and yeah, so with that, you know, so this is a picture from last year's competition of all of the all the competitors. Um, so you know, big giant room full of people, all the different schools represented. It's just a blast to be a part of, and uh, you know. 
I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to be able to put this on for all of these people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any, any last questions about anything so far? So it could be our team, our technical projects, event. Not necessarily a question, just uh, congratulations on a, a phenomenal uh, team and event. Uh, and you've got a lot of uh, student participation. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you guys so much for uh, for coming and sharing with us. This has been, uh, yeah, it's been a fascinating presentation. You got some, uh, definitely some cool robots there. And, uh, you know, have to, you'll have to come back and join us uh, down the road when you've done something, uh, you know, then and you're showing us what your, your next exciting uh, developments are. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anybody uh, got any more questions before we let these guys uh, go? I think James has a question. No, no, I was just mostly commentary. I was just uh, saying okay. a great presentation. Uh, yeah. I'm curious if you've thought about using an FPGA for the darts. Seems like the, the speed that you need to respond to get those to target that green LED is going to be pretty darn fast. Are they? Do they blink the LED, or is it just that it's green and fully on? It's uh, yeah. It's just it's constantly on, but it's pretty bright. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we get about one and a half seconds of flight time, uh, yeah. and you can only see the light in the second half when the <laughs> when the vehicle's pointing down. So yeah. Yeah. Using and, an FPGA then, to get the speed. Um, and then when you when you consider how fast you have to move the the, um, the just the mechanical speed of moving the fin. So what you might consider uh, here I am throwing out advice um, <laughs> is uh, just um, instead of using like a some kind of a CMOS or, or a higher resolution image sensor, just use literally four image sensors or something like that and and split up the field of view so that like if the left photo transistor sees green because it's behind a green filter right then um have a serve not a servo even just a solenoid that yanks the fins in that direction <laughs> right so that it's like a, a super simple super fast kind of a thing and then let it kind of oscillate back and forth as it transitions from you know like the left photo cell to the right photo cell or the top photo cell to the bottom photo cell and i'm saying photo cell and i mean photo transistor obviously because you have to have super fast reactions and i'm just just a little bit of um caution on that one um i was a part of a, a a group for a long time uh where one of the guys in the group was a student and he did a whole thing on um, um on on this basically he was using little model rockets and using an optical sensor to follow a led that was blinking on a small balloon like a weather balloon um and he got a visit from some guys in cheap suits who asked him to oh. change his uh change his uh um, this was one of the projects that he was doing for his thesis so <laughs> just uh you know be aware sometimes the government gets a little bit excited about people who aren't in the military making things that can fly in a specific direction. I think because yours aren't powered, it's probably fine, but I just thought that was funny and worth relating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, another way to do it would be to have overlapping fields of view and then uh, use a centering algorithm. Yeah, I know there's, uh, yeah, we discussed a lot of options for that, I think. Um, well, one of our biggest constraints on that is kind of the, we have to use a, there's like this nose cone piece. Uh, let's see if I can go way back to it. Uh, oh, oh, that's good. Uh, that one. Um, there's this weird little nose cone piece, which we have, which we're required to use as part of those spec uh, parts, um, which means the whatever sensing thing we have either has to look through this hole in the middle of it or has to just completely look around it. Um, and that really cuts into 
our kind of field of view and our options for how that works. I mean, we've toyed around with the idea of having mirrors and like reflectors, yeah, even like a periscope. <laughs> yeah. But, so is that is that piece there not clear? It looks like it's clear in the CAD drawing, uh, but I guess that's it, just. It's not really clear. So there is a there's like that hole, the circular hole which tapers to a square hole in the middle of it, um, but it it's got red and blue LEDs in it, so it lights up with the color of your team. Um, and well, it's, that's, it's, that's it's probably like okay though. That's probably okay though, isn't it? I mean, you want it to be um, you want it to be kind of limited in terms of its field of view and not like see a green thing somewhere yeah, off definitely. left, right? So just looking right. through the hole, I would imagine with a little teeny tiny thing with some diodes in it. And, and yeah, the idea of a centering algorithm and overlapping fields of view makes a lot of sense too. All right. Well, um, it is 12 or it's past 12 and um, yeah. we have our kind of full team general meetings. So that's why it's suddenly very noisy in this room behind us. Um, so unfortunately we're gonna have to call it quits here. Um, any last questions before, before we have to head out? But otherwise, yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate thank you guys. it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. Have a great day, guys. Good luck. Okay. Good thank luck you. to you guys. <laughs> okay. I got, uh, I'm just going to pop up my, come on. There we go. Share that. And then. All right. Thank you so much for all uh, everybody joining uh, joining us here. Um, just uh, usual kind of post presentation stuff. Same Zoom link next month. Uh, recordings will be posted when I get uh, get a chance. Um, and then you know check the website for any details and updates. Send me presenters. Uh, any kind of meeting feedback that you might have. And uh, um, so I'm uh, my. My son is waiting for me to get off of this meeting, so I'm going to, uh, I don't know if you guys, you know, is there any any interest in hanging around? I could probably pass the baton to Richard there if he's going to stick around for a little while. Because if not, um, we will just go ahead and uh, call it a meeting and uh, everybody get on with the, get on with the rest of their day. Thank you all for uh, joining us. And, oh, uh, great topic. Yeah, Thank you, Steve. And, yeah. So um, next month, um, Lloyd will be running the meeting. So I'm uh, I'm going to be I'm taking uh, my wife and I are traveling to Israel the first half of the month. We will actually be awesome. getting back from Israel about two days before this meeting. And I wasn't sure whether or not I'd be in readjusted to this time zone <laughs> to be able to run the meeting. So uh, uh, Lloyd is going to cover that. So um, anyway, next month. Uh, hopefully I'll see you guys, but uh, if not, I will uh, go ahead and stop recording and have a great trip. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. See you guys. See ya. See you guys. Have a great week or month, guys. Yeah.